It's Friday. It's the uh, 20th of June. I'm Moon Gon Young. This is Arirang News live from Seoul. Our top stories today. Seoul is keeping a watchful eye on just how Tokyo intends to interpret a document that was meant to settle the issue of comfort women back in 1993. U.S. will send up to 300 military advisors to Iraq to help its struggling security forces fend off a wave of Sunni militants. Is the U.S. edging back into a conflict that Mr. Obama once thought he had left behind? And World Cup at a glance, Cameroon down Cote d'Ivoire, Uruguay beat England and Japan and Greece play out a scoreless draw. We have a snapshot of day eight of the World Cup and matches to look forward to this weekend. But first, South Korea is keeping a watchful eye on how Tokyo will interpret its apology over the use of women across Asia as wartime sex slaves. Now, the, uh, the Abe administration is expected to announce the results of its review of the so-called Kono Statement sometime this Friday. The Kono Statement issued in 1993 is the Japanese government's acknowledgement and apology for its military sexual enslavement of women and girls before and during World War II. Now, speaking at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva Thursday, South Korean ambassador to the UN in Geneva, Choi Seok Young, called Japan's probe into the apology deplorable and regrettable. The South Korean government believes there is a sense of Japan, there is a sense that Japan is attempting to distance itself from the atrocities of the past through this review. Now, a lot depends on what the review suggests, of course, but any hint of a revision will send another chill down the already frosty Korea-Japan relations. Our UDN explains. Japan's Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary Katsunobu Gato is set to announce the result of a review on the Kono Statement Friday at a House of Representatives Budget Committee meeting. The statement was issued back in 1993 by then Chief Cabinet Secretary Yohei Kono and acknowledged for the very first time the Japanese Imperial Army had forced women, euphemistically called comfort women, into sexual slavery during World War II. In February, Japan said it would re examine the statement, drawing strong criticism from Korea, who slammed the neighboring country for its continued efforts to deny its historical wrongdoings. Speculation on the result of the review are running high, with concerns that Tokyo may try to revise or backtrack on the statement, given that Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe had said in the past that he did not believe women were coerced to work in military brothels. Japanese media reported earlier this week that the review will say the exact wording of the Kono statement was influenced by Korean bargaining. Seoul said it stands ready to counter the results of the examination and emphasized that the statement was made on Japan's own accord. Yudian, Arirang News. Now, Japan stands in great contrast to Germany when it comes to handling its wartime atrocities. Almost 70 years after the end of the World War II, German authorities this week tracked down a former Nazi who has been living in the United States for decades. Our Kwanzaa tells us the 89-year-old will likely be extradited to Germany to answer to the long-standing charges against him. Nearly 70 years have passed since the Second World War ended. 89-year-old Johann Breyer was 17 when he joined the Nazi military as a guard and for the past six decades has been living in the United States. But this week, Breyer was arrested in Philadelphia upon Germany's request on charges of having aided in the killing of 216,000 German, Hungarian and Czechoslovakian Jews in Auschwitz. He is um, guarding in the um Death's Head Battalion that he belonged to uh, were um, made it possible for those killings. There's a good chance that Breyer will now be turned over to Germany as the U.S. has an extradition treaty with the country. Ten years ago, a U.S. court ruled that Breyer was not responsible for his acts during World War II because he was so young when he joined the Nazis. Breyer, who has been living in the States since the 1950s, has claimed he was forced to carry out the heinous acts. 
Despite that, Germany never stopped looking for evidence and recently found out that Breyer had received several awards for his active participation in the genocide of Jews. Germany's persistence in punishing those responsible for past wrongdoings continues to gain attention here in Korea as it stands in stark contrast to Japan's attitude towards its past atrocities. Japanese authorities have done little to nothing to compensate or apologize to the women that were forced into sexual slavery by Japanese troops in the early 20th century. Kwon Suwa, Arirang News. Back here in this country, on the last day of government hearing at the National Assembly this Friday, lawmakers put the spotlight on President Park Geun-hye's nominee for Education Minister, questioning his qualifications for the post. Now, Kim Myung-soo is accused of publishing a research paper which is suspected to be a summary of one of his students' dissertations in his name when he was a professor at Korea National University of Education. Opposition party lawmakers also raised concerns about Kim's conservative stance on historical and educational issues, saying it could set the stage for clashes with the more liberal education superintendents elected in the June 4th local elections. Rival parties then bickered over Thursday's ruling over the Progressive Teachers Union, which lost a legal suit on its legal status, allowing the government to deregister the controversial organization. Meanwhile, Korea and the U.S. appear to be inching closer to putting pen to paper on a long-stalled civilian nuclear pact. Seoul-based broadcaster YTN reports that high-ranking Korean officials recently told reporters in Washington that two sides are fine-tuning the wording of a new draft and hope to have it signed by the end of this year. The two sides held the 10th round of nuclear negotiations earlier this week. Korea has been pushing to upgrade its strategic nuclear partnership with Washington as the current agreement, which was signed back in 1974, restricts Korea from enriching uranium and reprocessing spent fuel. Now, this has slowed Korea's attempts to broaden its exports of nuclear power plants, and the current agreement was recently extended to 2016. The U.S. is stepping into Iraq once again, but this time a little differently. President Obama is sending a substantial group of military advisors to Iraq, but they won't be on the front lines. He's actually ordered some 300 military advisors to back up Iraqi security personnel in their fight against the ISIL militants. Here's Connie Lee with this story. Washington is extending a much-needed helping hand to Iraq. The U.S. has decided to send about 300 military advisors to help Iraqi troops fight off insurgents. This nearly three years after President Barack Obama pulled the last U.S. troops out of the country. President Obama made it clear, though, that the help this time around will not be in combat. American forces will not be returning to combat in Iraq, but we will help Iraqis as they take the fight to terrorists who threaten the Iraqi people, the region. In a briefing at the White House on Thursday, Obama also stressed the need for Iraq's government to be more inclusive. It is clear, though, that only leaders that can govern with an inclusive agenda are going to be able to truly bring the Iraqi people together uh, and help them through this crisis. Meanwhile, the United States will not pursue military options to support one sect inside of Iraq at the expense of another. He added that the U.S. is not in position to choose Iraq's leaders. But citing support from the U.S., some political leaders in Iraq are calling for the prime minister to be replaced. Nuri al-Maliki has come under fire for his sectarian policies, favoring Shiite interests, and is widely blamed for the spiraling Sunni insurgency. The insurgents, called the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, or the ISIL, are now in control of many of Iraq's northern cities. And the ISIL, now eyeing Baghdad, poses the greatest threat to Iraq's security since the U.S.-led invasion back in 2003. Connie Lee, Arirang News.
Well, day eight of the 2014 FIFA World Cup saw two more groups move into their second round of matches, with Colombia dispatching Cote d'Ivoire 2 to 1 early on. Japan and Greece fought out a rather dull no pointer draw, while Uruguay defeated England to leave the European side on the brink of elimination. For all of the day's biggest winners and losers, and for what to look ahead this weekend, let's go to our sports correspondent, Song Ji Sun. Ji Sun, happy Friday to you. Happy Friday, everyone. The good thing about the weekend is that we can now watch the World Cup games morning or night without worrying too much about how we'll make it to work the very next day. In Thursday's action, Uruguay's Luis Suarez was the star of the night, scoring two excellent goals in the South American side's 2 1 victory over England. The English side, suffering their second straight defeat, stand on the brink of elimination now, needing Italy to do them a favor to have any chance at all. Suarez is well known to Korean fans here too, as it was his two goals in the second round of the 2010 World Cup which sent Korea packing. Also note that he finished the South American qualification phase for Brazil as a top scorer with 11 goals. England's Wayne Rooney scored his first goal in Brazil in his third World Cup, but an overall lackluster performance from England ensures they stay rooted on zero points after two games. Now elsewhere in Brazil, Japan and Greece each had chances to win the game, but it finished nil-nil with Greece a man short for most of the match after being sent off. On the other side, Colombia may now focus on their strategy for their round of 16 as they remain atop the group beating Cote d'Ivoire 2-1. With that said, let's take a look at where the teams stand in their groups a week after the World Cup kicked off. Now back in Iguazu Falls, Team Korea are busy preparing for their second group match. They had a day to recover with kimchi and beef after the Russian match, but they're back in the field now prepping for Algeria, the game they will be looking to win to give them a great shot at getting to the second stage. And they're certainly not short of confidence going to Sunday's match. The draw against Russia got us a point. And I witnessed how my team gave it their all during those 90 minutes. I'm sure my players will be in even better condition against Algeria. We've been studying how the Algerian side plays, their positions and characteristics. We are going to monitor their games in even more depth in the coming days. Team Korea's second match against Algeria kicks off at 4 p.m. Sunday local time. And here's a look at the game schedule for this Friday and the weekend. That wraps up our World Cup update for this Friday. And do not miss our live coverage of the nationwide cheering for Korea's next game on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend filled with football fever. We surely will. Thanks, Jisun, for that. Now, remember Paul the Octopus? Well, um, he shot to worldwide fame during the 2010 World Cup for his psychic ability to accurately predict match results. Well, Paul has a since passed of old age, but... Korea just may have found a replacement. Now, this one is no octopus. In fact, he's a former top-class footballer who played in a number of World Cup games himself, and he's now a commentator. Our Shin Samin has more on this new sidekick. Paul, the octopus, and the prognosticating turtles of Brazil have nothing on Korean broadcaster Lee young -pyo. The commentator for Korea Broadcasting Station has been accurately predicting the winners and even the scores of this year's World Cup in Brazil. Early on Korea's match against Russia this week, E, a retired Korean national soccer player, said forward Lee geun -ho was capable of piercing the Russian defense and added that if Team Korea could hold on until the 70th minute of the match, a chance would present itself. And one did. 60 minutes in and just 12 minutes after stepping onto the pitch for the first time, Egan Hole fired a long-range shot that found its way to the back of the net. But commentator E's predictions don't end there. Last month during the World Cup preliminary ground stage, he said that the Spanish national team was entering a dark period. 
That turned out to be an accurate call as well as the defending champs have already been knocked out from advancing. E's prediction for the games and scores between Italy and England and Ivory Coast against Japan also turned out to be right. Lee, an ex-Tottenham Hotspur defender, insisted that his forecasts were hardly lucky guesses, but that hasn't stopped people from referring to him as the next Paul the Octopus. Since I'm in, Arirang News. I don't know how much you'd like that new nickname. Now, Koreans love to eat fried chicken and drink a beer during big sporting events. In fact, uh, this combination is so popular that it has its own name, Chimek. Chi for chicken, mek for beer in Korea, mekju. Well, World Cup time is usually a boom time, but with most of the games starting so early in the morning here in Korea this time around, Korean football fans are getting their snack food from elsewhere. Our Kim Hyun Bin reports. Chimek, a word that combines chicken and the Korean word for beer, mekju, is the go-to food and drink during sporting events here in the nation. Statistics back it up. During the 2010 World Cup in South Africa, sales of chicken and beer in Korea almost doubled compared to the same period in the previous year. A similar effect was seen during the 2006 World Cup. But the effect has been muted during this year's global event, mainly due to the time difference between Brazil and Korea. In many ways, it's a repeat of what was seen during the 2010 World Cup when sales were up for games watched in the evening here in Korea. As for Korea's early morning match against Nigeria, it was a much different story. Although sales were up, they paled in comparison to figures from the night games. While Team Korea plays its games in Brazil, it will be the early morning here in Korea. A fact that doesn't please chicken franchises. The World Cup games are starting in the wee hours this year. Chimek was not part of the hype, so sales have been lower than expected. Although it's clear that fried chicken and beer businesses won't see sales go through the roof, as in past World Cup events, there's a certain type of business that's benefiting from the Brazil-Korea time difference. It's the 24-hour convenience store. Sales have gone up since the World Cup started, especially snacks and ready-to-eat meals. CU also has World Cup promotions to attract customers. According to CU, a major convenience store franchise, Sales of ready-to-eat meals and snacks were up 15 percent, bottled water up over 50 percent, and coffee up nearly 10 percent during the first week of the Brazil World Cup, compared to a week earlier. Kim Young bin Arirang News. All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Moon Gon Yong, live from Seoul. Mobile shopping market for the dual use of the Korean name EC and the Japanese name C of Japan in school textbooks in the state of Virginia. Well, summer weather is already definitely here in Korea as uh, people in shorts, t-shirts and sunglasses start to come out and they will be looking to the cinemas for a cool venue and to, you know, escape the heat. Now, a few blockbusters have already left a mark in the past few weeks, but the biggest films of the year are still just around the corner as both Korea and Hollywood have scheduled their top releases for the high season. Now, even with the World Cup in full swing, I think should kick off in a big way next week with the hotly anticipated Transformers 4, yes, Transformers 4, before Korea hits back with a series of big budget period films. Here to give us the uh, lowdown on what to look forward to, to during the summer months is our film critic Pierce Conran. Hello Pierce, uh, we skipped a few weeks and now uh, it's good to have you back. It's great to be back. Now, uh, due to the recent events in the news and of course uh, with the World Cup taking place, it must seem to be less busy than usual this time around. Do you think things will uh, take a turn in the coming weeks? It's certainly true that business has been a little down compared to the last two years, which of course were kind of big boom years. 
And partly that has to do, of course, with uh, things that happened, you know, the, the tragedy, of course, that happened in the news recently. And uh, also, I think that uh, because we've been doing so well for a while that any kind of drop is kind of seen as a bit of a disappointment. But um, I do think that'll kind of turn around very quickly. We're coming into the big summer period right now. And while the last few months have been a little slow, we've got a few very, very big films on the way. And I think it's we'll be seeing things changing a little bit. At the moment, what's funny is we have uh, the number two, number one and two films are Edge of Tomorrow, the Tom Cruise sci-fi blockbuster, which has been doing very well, mm -hmm. and the Korean film A Hard Day, a favorite of mine. Uh, they've been number one and two for the last few weeks, and they may well do, uh, do that for a fourth weekend uh, coming up now, which is uh, quite remarkable. But after that, we'll be seeing a very different picture at the box office. Right. I mean, uh, I, I know you've been, you know, you've been so, uh, so excited about the Hard Day, a Hard mm -hmm. Day, and I actually checked it out myself, and mm -hmm. me being being not a big fan of a thriller, I actually enjoyed it, yeah, so it, fun, it was right? pretty good. Now, um, does with Transformers 4 and everything, does anything stand a chance in, in battling against robots? Um, I don't think so, <laughs> <laughs> honestly. Uh, I mean, the, the previous Transformers films have been huge hits here. The last one, Transformers 3, currently holds the opening weekend record, so it had a uh, 2.3 million admissions in its first weekend. That's 5% that's, of the country coming out to see the film in three days. Um, and so that record stands. Uh, whether this new one will make another record remains to be seen, but it's going to do very, very well. Um, mind you, the film is very long. It's 166 minutes, almost three hours. But um, it's, going to be, it's going to be a huge hit, and uh, I don't think anything will take that crown for a while. So uh, what do you think is likely to take first place when Transformers uh, finishes its reign? Um, well, there's a few films coming up before it, uh, or a few films that are coming up j just after. I don't know that they'll topple it, but we have some Korean films like The Divine Move, the new film starring Jong Woo Sung, who's, mm. uh, his films have done very well at the box office in the past, a very popular star. This film looks, uh, looks very well made. I don't know how good it is yet, but, uh, but uh, his previous hit was Cold Eyes, not a thriller that came out at the same time last year. So uh, that could do well as well. It won't unseat Transformers, but it may do well. A uh, week after that, we'll have Confessions, which doesn't have any very big stars. Another thriller. We've had so many recently that uh, I think there might be some fatigue in there. I don't know if that film is going to make much of an impression. But what will be Transformers, I think, will be the new Planet of the Apes film, which is mm -hmm. called Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Now, that's the second one since this kind of new reboot. That was uh, The Rise of the Planet of the Apes three years ago. They're very long titles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but th this is coming three weeks after Transformers comes out. Mm. So it will be number one for three weeks and then it might concede to this one. The first one had uh, almost three million admissions three years ago, so I think it'll do well and it'll be just enough to be first. But that, uh, that reign will be short-lived, I believe. Right, so um, let's talk more about the uh, Korean films that are set to be released uh, last week of July, right? Um, second to last week. No, second to last yeah, week. Yeah, July 23rd. It's going to be the first uh, big Korean release mm. of the summer. Uh, now, that's going to be Kundo, The Age of the Rampant. It's the first big one, but I believe it's going to be the biggest one, actually. Mm. Um, it'll, it stars Ha Jung Woo, who's been very popular recently, um, very charismatic star. Films like The Berlin File, Terror Live last year, very, very successful. Also, he's directed a movie, right? Uh, yes. In fact, his second film will be coming out oh. uh, most likely in Chuseok this mm. year uh, as a director. So that's uh, his a new thing he's doing. Um, this film uh, reteams him with, with his uh, director pal uh, Yoon Jong Bin, who made Nameless Gangster. They made two other films before mm -hmm. that as well. That was very successful. This film looks great. The studio, Showbox, is very confident in it. The marketing looks great. Um, and uh, I think it looks just really kind of fun. And it's got that, it's got that really kind of clutch weekend, uh, July 23rd, the same time, um, same time release as films such as The Host or The Thieves or Snowpiercer, some of the biggest films in, mm. in Korean history. So I think that's going to do really, really well. Well, uh, how do you think the other major Korean films will fare during that period? Uh, there's a few other big ones. In fact, uh, each consecutive week has one very big release. They're not, the dates are not set, but I think that's what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is the next two are period films again. Uh, mm -hmm. We've spoken we've about had, period films. We've yeah. actually had a few of them, right? We've had quite already. a few already. We had The Huntresses and, uh, for Lunar New Year, and mm -hmm. we had uh, The Fatal Encounter of Hyun Bin, right. which did relatively well a few weeks ago. So now we have three, and then we have another one even later in the year, but wow. that's another discussion. Uh, so we have Roaring Currents, going to be the first one after Kundo. Um, this is a, a naval uh, 
warfare film, a uh, period film starring Chae Min Sik and uh, Ri Seung Young. Mm, um, big namers, right? Very big names, uh, and I think people will come out for that. It's mm. from the same director as uh, War of the Arrows and the very successful period film from a few years ago. Uh, the film looks, you know, I think will be good. It'll be, it'll be a little, I don't, it won't be a lot of fun, I think, but it'll be well made. Uh, the problem is it really skews towards men, I think, and I don't think, I don't really know that women are going to be interested, and uh, I don't think families are going to be interested. So oh, really? It, yeah, it's a very expensive film, so that's why mm -hmm. I worry, because uh, I don't think it can hope to hit every, every audience demographic. Uh, one film that does kind of hit the boxes to attract everyone is a week later is the Pirates, which is essentially kind of a Pirates of the Caribbean mm -hmm. kind of done Korean style. Um, the film doesn't really look very strong. The marketing has been pretty weak and um, people are, there's not a lot of excitement. Um, I mean, it could potentially interest a lot of people. It's got a pretty wide appeal, but I just don't know if the film itself will, will carry that. Another expensive film at $15 million. Wow. Uh, so I don't know what's, how that's going to do. The last film is really the wild card. This is Sea Fog, which is the one that I'm personally most excited about on kind of an aesthetic level anyway. Mm -hmm. um, it's, now it's a very dark film. It's a, a seafaring thriller. The problem there, of course, is that there's these very unfortunate parallels with the Sewol disaster. Oh. And some people feel that, that that spells doom for the film. Uh, it's produced by Bong Joon-ho, uh, so we can expect a certain level of quality there, uh, or we certainly I know I you're hope. a big fan of Bong Joon-ho, right? Huge. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you can be a little bit biased then. I am completely biased. <laughs> <laughs> um, now the thing is, uh, of course, I'm 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 maybe bullish about the film, but uh, I do have a feeling that the film will surprise people, not just in its quality, but that it might actually, it might come just far enough away to kind of be the kind of film that could really kind of mean people might rally around. I don't know. I don't know that for a fact at all. We haven't seen much of the film yet, but I'm excited. Well, another exciting summer to look forward to, and uh, I believe we have some more coming up, uh, different events in July, but we will save that for next week, and uh, it was great talking to you. Great talking to you. All right, and that's just about all from me at this hour. I'm Moon Gonyang. Check back with us at 4 p.m. Korea time for Business Today.